What comes to mind when you think of market research? Do you think of a survey? Maybe a focus group? Well, you're partially correct, but that's not the whole story. To get started, let's understand what market research is and why you should do it. Market research is the function that links you to your customer through information. In its most simplistic form, market research is simply a process for collecting market information. But market research can and should be much more than that. Your real goal is not just gathering information, but gleaning insights. Insights are the difference between having facts about your customer and really knowing your customer. An insight is sometimes called an epiphany, an aha moment, or a eureka feeling, when a solution to a problem presents itself suddenly. Insights come when you dig beneath the surface, going beyond just what the customer is saying, and looking for a motivating behavior. Do you remember New Coke? This was considered one of the biggest product flops in history. In 1985, sales of Coca-Cola had decreased by 24% as their core demographic aged. So Coca-Cola decided to reformulate Coke to be sweeter, to compete with Pepsi. Significant market research was done, and the facts showed that in blind taste testing, the new Coke outperformed both Pepsi and traditional Coke. 200,000 taste tests confirmed this preference. And yet, the introduction of new Coke was nothing short of a disaster. It wasn't just that consumers didn't buy it. The company actually received over 400,000 letters from angry customers. Why? Because they had the facts, but missed this insight. Brand loyalty trumps taste. People had an emotional attachment to the iconic brand and didn't want it to be replaced, even if it tasted better. Unfortunately for them, the aha moment came after the product was launched. There's no shortage of examples of product developers who didn't do market research because they just knew their product was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But it wasn't. In today's market, consumers are constantly bombarded with new products, and trends change almost daily. Never assume you know what your customers want. The risks are just too high. So why do market research? It centers your business on your customer. It keeps you focused. It allows you to pursue the right opportunities and abandon those that aren't. It keeps you relevant and future-oriented. And it improves your decision-making capabilities and reduces your risk. The key to success is a deep understanding of your customer. Market research is how you get there. If you could sit down with one of your customers today, what would you want to learn? Think about what you would want to know. What questions could you ask them that would give you a deeper understanding of your market? Maybe you'd like to know why they buy your product. Do they buy for themselves or for others? What about how they perceive your company versus your competition? What could you be doing better to win more of their business? Chances are, there is at least one insight waiting to be discovered. And the more insights that you discover, the more information you have to make sound business decisions. How are you making important business decisions today? Are you just going with your gut? Maybe you're asking a trusted advisor. Or maybe you're watching what your competition is doing. Any of these methods might work, but it's still a bit of a guessing game. What market research does is take the guessing out of it. Simply put, to make a good decision, you need good information, and market research is a key source of that information. Let's say someone comes to you with a new product idea and wants you to invest in it, but all they can tell you is how the product works. Without any additional information, that's a risky investment. You would likely want to know things like, is there a need for the product? Who are the competitors and how does this product stack up to them? How big is the market? What do potential customers think of the product? Each piece of additional information, backed up by research, makes the decision less risky. Market research gives you the information you need to help identify opportunities and problems and find solutions to address these. It also helps you develop marketing or business strategies. Another important use 
is to help you assess customer reactions to products, ads, prices, and packaging. And you might use market research to monitor customer satisfaction or marketing performance. One of the areas where market research is used most frequently is in marketing. The principal task of marketing is to create value for customers. And to create value, you need an in-depth understanding of the market and the customers. And by now we know that understanding the customers, who they are, how they behave, why they behave as they do, is at the heart of market research. Marketing decisions involve everything from major shifts in the positioning of a business or the decision to enter a new market, to tactical questions like how to price a product. Let's look at the four stages of the marketing planning process to see how you would use market research for each. The first stage is situation analysis, otherwise known as a SWOT analysis. This is essentially where you're taking the temperature of your organization in several key areas. You're asking questions like, what are the potential threats and how do we address them? Where are their potential opportunities and what can we do to leverage them? And what's our competition doing and how should we respond? The second stage is strategy development, which is essentially deciding where you want to be and how you're going to get there. Here, you might be asking questions like these. What segments of the market should we serve? What are our competitive advantages? And how should we measure performance? The third stage is marketing program development. You may have heard this described as the four P's, product, price, place, promotion. You'll be asking questions that address the four P's. How should we position and price the product? How are we going to distribute the product? And which promotional opportunities will be most effective? The final stage is implementation. Now that you've put your plan and program in place, do you need to make any modifications? You'll be asking, how are we doing against our performance measures? How satisfied are our customers? And how could we refine our strategy or tactics? So think about the decisions that you need to make in the near future. Do you have solid information or are you going with your gut? What questions could you ask to improve your decision-making ability and reduce your risk? You don't have to be in the marketing department to use market research. Whatever your role is, chances are you're making decisions and market research can help you make informed decisions. Ever heard the expression, ready, aim, fire? How about ready, fire, aim? We've all been there. When you need to make a decision and move quickly, there's a tendency to shoot first and ask questions later. The same is true when someone says, I need this information and I need it yesterday, which is all too common at the start of a market research project. Market research is about asking questions, but that doesn't mean it's always the answer. So the first question that you should ask is, should we do the research? To determine this, you'll want to consider a number of factors. First, why do you need to do the research? In other words, what decisions are hinging on the information? If you can't clearly define the decisions, the results will just be nice to know and not need to know. And although it appears evident, you will also want to ask, has a conclusion already been reached? If the CEO has already made a decision, will the information from the research really make a difference? Next, you want to consider if it's worth doing the research. Cost, budgets, and timelines always play a role. First, ask yourself, what is the cost of not knowing? In other words, does the value of the research exceed the cost of getting the information? If so, then ask, Am I willing to make the investment to do the research correctly? And am I willing to allow the time necessary to do the research correctly? If the quality of the market research is going to be compromised due to budget limitations or time restrictions, maybe you shouldn't do it. Because if the research is worth doing, it's worth doing well. Lastly, you want to consider what you will do with the information. If you aren't going to use the findings, you shouldn't do the research. Is there a commitment through all levels of the organization to use results? And do we have the budget to implement the findings? And as a final check before proceeding, you probably want to ask the obvious. Has someone in the organization already done this research? In a larger company, 
you might be surprised at how often this turns out to be the case. So when you're ready to engage in that market research project, stop to aim before you fire. Ask yourself, can we clearly define the decisions that are hinging on this research? Are we willing to invest the time and money to do this right? Does everyone agree that we will act on the findings, and do we have the budget to do so? If you can answer yes to each of these questions, congratulations, you are ready to start the market research process. Albert Einstein once said, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would use the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, solving the problem is easy. The formulation of a problem is often more essential than its solution. So it is with market research. Understanding the nature of the problem will ensure that the right problem is being investigated and that the information obtained will be useful to solving the problem at hand. To illustrate, let's consider a very simple example. Let's say that Joe, the head of marketing, asks you to conduct a study to evaluate the effectiveness of the most recent ad campaign. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? So off you go and you come back with the results showing that the campaign was moderately effective. You've done your job and given Joe what he asked for. But what if Joe's real question is how much should we allocate to the advertising budget? Or why aren't sales higher? Does knowing the effectiveness of the ad campaign give him the information he needs to answer these questions? You can see how critical it is to formulate the problem correctly in order to execute the right research. And you should never assume that the person asking for the research has accurately articulated the real need. Here are three steps to formulate the right research problem. Step one is understand the background. Ask questions like, what circumstances are prompting the research? Who are the stakeholders and what's at stake for them? What decisions are you trying to make based on the research? So in our example, we might have uncovered that sales have not hit targets and Joe is being asked to come up with a plan to increase sales, but he'll have to do so with a lower budget unless he can justify the existing budget. This puts the need for research into perspective. Step two is translate the business problem into a research problem. Business problems focus on an action. In our example, this might have been increased sales with a lower budget. The research problem rephrases the business problem into meaningful terms from an analytical point of view. Identify potential reasons that sales have not been higher. The research problem always starts with action verbs like evaluate, assess, identify, measure, determine. Think of it this way. The business problem is what marketing needs to do. The research problem is what marketing needs to know to do it. Step three is create a hypothesis. In this case, what are the possible causes for sales being under forecast? From Joe's initial request, he may be hypothesizing that not enough money was allocated to the advertising and therefore the campaign was not effective. But it could also be that a new competitor has entered the market, or the quality of the product has not lived up to expectations, or the distributors have more of an incentive to push a different product. These hypotheses will drive the topics that will be covered during the research. Once you've done this, you put the information into a clearly defined research objective. What needs to be done, the action, and with whom, the target market, what information is needed, how is the information going to be used. So back to our example. What needs to be done? We need to identify potential reasons why sales have been lower within our target market. What information is needed? Determine what factors impact which product a customer purchases, then evaluate their perception of our product on each of these factors. How will the information be used? Results from this research will inform the action plan for increasing sales and creating a budget. Yogi Berra is credited for saying, if you don't know where you're going, you will often end up someplace else. Are you asking the right questions to ensure that you will get the right answers? Do you know what the single most important question is that your research must address? 
make sure you know where you're going. If you were planning to build a house, what would be your reaction if your builder came back and said, blueprint? No, no, I know what you want. We don't need a blueprint. I'm thinking you might be looking for a different builder. While it is possible to build a house without a blueprint, the final product may be different than what you ordered. The research design is to market research what the blueprint is to home building. It's the framework or plan for the study which will act as the guide for data collection. And just like there is no single right way to build a house, there's no single right way to do research. However, you can categorize research designs in much the same way as you might categorize houses as ranch, split level, and two-story. Research approaches are categorized into one of three types, exploratory, descriptive, causal. Let's take a look at each. The first type of approach, exploratory research, is just that, an exploration. The general objective is to gain insights and ideas about the problem. You would use this most often when you don't know very much about the problem. Here are three examples of when you might use exploratory research. To develop a hypothesis or clarify concepts. For instance, if you want to understand what is meant by ease of use so that you can develop a method to measure it. To establish priorities for further research. For instance, if your sales have decreased, you might use exploratory research to get a sense of whether this is due to new competitors, poor quality, or any number of other possible factors. This would tell you then where you should focus your more detailed research. To increase familiarity with the problem. For example, if you are developing a product in a new category and you don't know much about the category. The second type of approach, descriptive research, makes up the bulk of the market research that is done. It's generally based on one or more hypotheses, which implies that you do have some information about the problem. Three potential ways you might use descriptive research are to describe the characteristics of certain groups, for example, developing the profile of the average user of your product in terms of demographics, attitudes, and or behaviors. To estimate the proportion of people in a specified population who behave a certain way. For instance, the proportion of your average users who buy your product at a specific store. And to make predictions. For example, predicting the level of sales for each of the next three years if your product is placed in these stores. Our final type of research is causal research. You would use causal research when you're trying to test a cause and effect relationship between two variables. You start with a hypothesis. For example, shelf placement is a critical factor in sales. So where we have good shelf placement, we have good market penetration. That's the hypothesis you'll test. If in your research you determine that in a large number of territories with good shelf placement, you do not have satisfactory market share, then you would conclude that your hypothesis is not true. Good shelf placement does not necessarily mean you will have good market penetration. So have you created a blueprint, or are you just forging ahead with a hammer and a bucket of nails? How much do you know about your problem? Do you have enough information to create at least one hypothesis, or are you trying to get a feel for what's going on at this stage? Are you looking to understand, uncover, or identify? Are you looking to measure, select, or prioritize? If you can answer these questions, you're ready to select the type of research that will best solve the business problem at hand and begin to develop your blueprint. Imagine you aren't feeling well and you visit your doctor. You have a good doctor who keeps up with all the most recent studies on various illnesses and potential treatments. One of the first things he does is review your chart, checking for any underlying medical conditions. Then he's likely to ask you questions about your symptoms, such as when they started and how severe they are. He may take your vitals, perhaps do some blood work, and run some tests. And finally, he may give you a prescription or suggest that you do something differently to see if that helps. Your doctor has multiple methods of obtaining data that may lead to a correct diagnosis and treatment. Similarly, you have multiple data collection methods at your disposal. Once you've formulated the problem and categorized the research approach, it's time to consider how you are going to get the data you need. You may select one or multiple methods, as our doctor did. 
So let's consider at a high level what options you might choose from. Secondary research, contrary to its name, is the first thing you should consider. It uses data that is already available, information that someone else collected for some purpose other than solving your present problem. There are two types of secondary research, using internal data and external data. In our doctor example, the current studies that he reads on treatments and conditions could be considered a type of external secondary data, while reviewing your charts would be more like internal secondary data. Primary research is research that is specifically commissioned for the problem at hand. And there are three types of primary research, qualitative, quantitative, and experimental. Qualitative research is about uncovering feelings or understanding decision making. Quantitative is generally more about numbers and objective data. In our doctor example, asking you about your symptoms could be considered qualitative research, while getting tests could be considered quantitative. Sending you home with a few things to try to see if they work would fall into the experimental category. Let's consider an example that's in the business realm. You work for GE, and you're interested in understanding the difference in the demographics of customers who are buying your refrigerators versus your competitors. You might first turn to industry data that's been collected on refrigerator purchases. This is available to anyone. It's not specifically about your project, but could provide some valuable information. This would be considered external secondary data. You might also analyze the warranty card information that is turned in by your own customers, which would be considered internal secondary data since it already exists in-house. You could alternatively interview buyers and potential buyers to understand their attitudes and preferences. You could use this to profile the segments that purchase your refrigerators versus the competitors. And this could be done using qualitative research. You could then do a quantitative study to determine what portion of your buyers fall into specific demographic or attitudinal segments. Experimental might not be appropriate in this instance, but for illustration purposes, you could set up observation in Home Depot and watch who buys which refrigerators. Going back to our doctor example, as a patient, do you want your doctor to rely on just one method of gathering data? No. You want them to be selective, but willing to use whatever combination of methods are appropriate to make an accurate diagnosis and prescribe treatment. As you consider your market research problem, you have a whole toolbox at your disposal. You may not need all the tools, but you should pick and choose the ones that will work for you. You need to determine the best way to get information that can shed light on the problem and data that will point to potential solutions. The last time you bought a car or made a major purchase, did you do any research first? Did you look at consumer reports, read reviews, or consult any other resources? My guess is you probably did, which means you were using secondary data to help you answer the question, which one should I buy? Secondary research is data that is already available, information that someone else collected for some purpose other than your specific research problem. Often, once the research problem has been defined, the natural tendency is to jump right in and create a survey. However, it's a good rule of thumb to pause, and consider what you can learn from secondary data first. The main advantages of secondary data are the time and money they can save. Essentially, someone else has already spent the money to conduct the research. So instead of spending weeks preparing the survey, fielding the survey, and analyzing the data, you simply read the other information that's available. And in the age of the internet, it is easier than ever to access a multitude of information with a few clicks of the mouse. Let's say that you have invented a new pet product that will be targeted to people with incomes of $40,000 to $100,000, and you need to do some forecasting. A quick Google search provides multiple hits for statistics on pet populations, ownership, and trends in the U.S. Information from this search may answer some of your questions and help you refine what other information you might want to seek with primary research. Census.gov is a website that provides a plethora of information, including populations, household incomes, size of households, all split out by age, ethnicity, and geography, among many other factors. And for our pet project, they even include the number of households with pets, 
number and types of pets, dollars spent on pets, and even annual number of trips to the veterinarian. However, it's important to be mindful of the disadvantages of secondary research, including the uncertainty surrounding the accuracy or quality of the data and the potential for the data to be an imperfect fit with what you need. For example, let's say one of the sources reports household income in increments of 30 to 69,000 and 79 to 109,000. This doesn't fit precisely with the 40 to 100,000 dollar range that you need. Although the secondary data will rarely be an exact fit for your question, it's a good place to start for several reasons. First, even if not precise, it may be enough to address your needs and you can eliminate the need for the primary research altogether. Second, it may answer some of your general questions, which means you can spend your time and money asking more specific questions. Third, it may provide you with some information that leads you to ask different questions than you had initially intended. General sources of secondary information include directories, trade associations and professional societies, government websites such as census.gov, business intelligence reports such as Dun and Bradstreet or Moody's, periodicals, newsletters, and journals, and online databases. Think of secondary research as doing your homework. What is your research problem? Type it into Google and see where it leads you. What trade associations and periodicals come up? Visit their websites. Do a specific search within their site. You will probably find that there is too much information rather than not enough. The purpose of qualitative research is to access the emotions of your consumers, to get an in-depth understanding of what they're thinking and why they do the things they do. It's designed to reveal their behavior, understand what is driving that behavior, and discover what might motivate a change in behavior. In qualitative research, an interviewer, called a moderator, leads a person or group of people, called respondents, through a discussion on a particular topic. In contrast to a quantitative survey, where all questions are asked exactly the same way and in the same order, qualitative research uses a less structured discussion guide. As its name implies, this is a set of discussion topics with open-ended questions and probes that guide the discussion. As a result, the moderator is able to push respondents to reflect and explore their feelings, perceptions, and behaviors. Let's consider an example to illustrate. You work for Andy's, a national chain of family restaurants, and you're planning to renovate all of the restaurants to appeal more to the younger 20 to 30 year olds without losing the current appeal to families. You may conduct focus groups with parents who regularly eat at Andy's with their families to discover what it is about Andy's that appeals to them. You'll be looking to discover not just what they like, but why those features are important and how they make your customer feel. It's often the underlying emotion that drives loyalty to a brand. For example, you might ask them to tell you about a memorable experience they had at Andy's, or to describe the types of occasions when they go to Andy's. Or you may ask, what is the one thing Andy's should change, and what is the one thing they should not change? You may also conduct focus groups with 20 to 30 year olds to understand what types of places they frequent. Again, you'll be looking for in-depth descriptions, good and bad, that will help you appreciate the overall experience that this target audience desires. While the dynamic and flexible nature of qualitative research is the great advantage, the subjectivity is considered by some to be one of its disadvantages. Another disadvantage is that it relies on a small sample of people, which may or may not reflect the views of the entire population of consumers. As a result, qualitative research is directional in nature. It's not considered conclusive. So if you need to really understand your customer, understand the emotions that drive their decisions, understand why they behave a certain way, start with qualitative research. Quantitative research is all about numbers and statistics. It seeks to quantify the thoughts and actions of a target audience 
to understand past or current behaviors and or to predict future behaviors. How satisfied are our customers? How will a price increase impact sales? What is the market size for our new product? To illustrate, let's continue with our Andy's restaurant example. Recall that you work for Andy's, a national chain of family restaurants, and you're planning to renovate all of the restaurants to appeal more to the younger 20 to 30 year olds without losing the current appeal to families. Because you are looking to quantify your results, all questions should be written in a way that produce numerical results. Some questions are naturally quantitative in that they ask for a numerical answer, such as, how often do you eat out in an average month? On average, how much do you spend when you eat out? How often do you order a salad or an alcoholic beverage? How far do you typically drive to a restaurant? Or how far are you willing to drive? Other questions may not request numerical responses, but are asked in such a way as to be able to quantify the results. On a scale of 1 to 7, please rate how important each of the following factors are as reasons that you visit Andy's, where 1 is not at all important and 7 is extremely important. On a scale of 1 to 5, please indicate how strongly you agree or disagree with each of the following statements. Because one of the main goals of quantitative research is to statistically reflect the views of a population, the execution of the research is critical. Several things must hold true. The sample population that is included must be representative of the entire population of your target audience. This may include considerations of demographics, socioeconomic factors, geographic distribution, gender, ethnicity, specific purchase or activity behaviors, etc. The sample population must be large enough to ensure that the results will be statistically projectable to the total population. In other words, you want to be sure that the results you got with this sample would be reproducible if you conducted the survey again with different people. Finally, the questions must be well formulated, unambiguous, with a complete set of mutually exclusive options. If not, you're left wondering what the respondent was thinking when they answered the question. In renovating the Andes restaurants, you will want to look at whether responses differed by region of the country or by age or by socioeconomic factors. Andes in California may require a slightly different layout, a different menu, or a different neighborhood location than Andes in Ohio. Or you may decide to market to a slightly different audience in one location versus another based on the market potential. If this all sounds complex, just know that it's standard practice to consult a statistician on the front end of a quantitative project to ensure that the sample size and characteristics will produce statistically relevant results. So if your research problem seeks to quantify thoughts and actions, such as forecasting sales, predicting consumer behavior, or measuring satisfaction, a quantitative study may be in order. What would you say if someone asked you to describe how you do laundry? If you're like most people, you would say something like, uh, I sort the laundry into whites and colors, put it in the washer, add detergent, when it's done, move it to the dryer, etc. The problem with asking someone how they do something is that they primarily think about main steps, leaving smaller steps out because they don't think they're relevant, or they may not even realize they're doing something. But if you are trying to come up with a new product idea to facilitate doing laundry, those little steps, or the unconscious compensating behaviors, may provide precisely the insight that fuels a new idea. The way around this is ethnography, which is a method of observational research. Ethnography is systematically watching someone do something in his or her native environment. In our laundry case, this would involve watching people do load after load of laundry under different circumstances, in their home, apartment, or laundromat, whatever is their natural environment. Consider that years ago, people would measure detergent in a measuring cup. Ethnography revealed that people would frequently misplace the measuring cup or simply not use it because it was an added step. Instead, they were using the lid of the detergent bottle to guesstimate the quantity, but when they put the lid back on, whatever detergent was left in the lid would leak down the side of the bottle. That little discovery 
led to adding drainage slits in the bottle and measuring lines on the lid. Ethnography with surgeons in operating rooms has led to the development of instruments that are more ergonomically suited for where a surgeon stands relative to the patient. Ethnography in health clubs led to the addition of magazine racks and water bottle holders on the treadmills after observing people consistently crafting their own holders during workouts. Ethnographic research is often referred to as in-homes or shop-alongs, depending on the type of observation it entails. In shop-alongs, you would accompany the respondent on a shopping trip and observe how they shop, what catches their attention, what do they pick up, what do they read, and ultimately, what do they buy? This might lead to changes in package design or shelf placement, or, if you're the store owner, perhaps in the redesign of the store. The key is to watch for annoyances or inconveniences and for compensating behaviors. What do consumers do as a workaround for something that is not exactly what they want or need? These are opportunities for innovation. Another method of observation is simulation. Like ethnography, simulation involves watching someone do something. However, unlike ethnography, it's done in a simulated environment. For example, you may have a test kitchen where you bring people in and watch them bake cakes. Or you may set up shelves of cereal similar to how they would look at a grocery store and watch people shop. The advantage of this is that it is a controlled environment and potentially makes it easier to observe. The downside is that it cannot exactly replicate the natural environment, so some things may be missed. A third method of observation is an experiment. Similar to simulation, you're watching people do something in a simulated environment. But in this case, you may have different environments or multiple product options to see how a change impacts behavior. For example, maybe you arrange the cereal in two different ways on the shelves and see if it alters which products consumers pick. Or perhaps you stock this test kitchen with different utensils or different cake mixes and see what impact this has on how the cakes are made. Observational research is a great tool, but it isn't for every project. Think about your project. Would observation be useful to accomplishing your goals? If so, how and where does your customer interact with your product, and is it feasible to observe this? Observational research is expensive and time-consuming, but if it's appropriate, it always leads to the discovery of some critical nuance that might otherwise have been missed. Let's assume that a company is looking to develop a new product line of fragrances that you can add to a load of laundry. With this product, you can add any fragrance you want and as much or as little as you like. The company wants to conduct some market research to predict potential purchase. How do you think their predictions would differ if they talked to all shoppers age 18 and older who shopped at Walmart on Saturday and Sunday versus moms who do at least eight loads of laundry a week versus people who buy scented laundry detergent or anyone who buys at least one bottle of laundry detergent per month. You might expect that the opinions of each of these groups of people would vary, right? The point is who you talk to can influence what you hear. Doesn't matter how many people you talk to, if they aren't the right people, you will likely end up with incorrect or irrelevant information. So first, you want to define your target audience based on the research objectives. In the example above, perhaps the company decides to include women in the U.S., ages 25 to 45, who do at least four loads of laundry a week. But they want to exclude anyone who says they will only buy unscented products. The population refers to everyone in your target audience, in this case, every single person in the U.S. who fits the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now, since it is likely impractical to talk to the entire population of your target audience, you will talk to a sample of the population whose opinions will then represent the total population. In addition to inclusion and exclusion criteria, there are three primary things you will consider in creating the sample. First is the size of the sample. This will depend on the type of research you are doing, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, time and budget constraints, and how critical it is to ensure that the sample is statistically representative of the population. Second will be quotas for specific characteristics that define your population. 
In our example, we might want to ensure that we have a specific number of ethnically diverse women in our group to ensure that the total population is represented. And while we've said women ages 25 to 45, we may want to ensure that a specific percentage are 25 to 34 and 35 to 45, so we don't end up with everyone being 25 to 30. We may also want to ensure that we have a mix of women in different socioeconomic categories, or a mix of those who live in rural, suburban, and urban locations, or in different parts of the country, to get all perspectives. In quantitative research, you may want to look for differences among these groups. How does the opinion of someone who is 25 to 34 differ from that of someone 35 to 45? How does the opinion of someone on the East Coast differ from that of someone on the West Coast? Third are special considerations required for the research. For example, maybe they have to have internet access. Now, not everyone in your population will have internet access, so your sample will not be totally representative. Or perhaps everyone has to be fluent in English, or has to be comfortable talking in a group. Just know that these may decrease how representative your sample is, but the trade-off may be worth it to ensure that you're able to get the information you're looking for. So who do you need to talk to to ensure that the data you collect is relevant and applicable to your research objective? Can you define what the inclusion and exclusion criteria should be to recruit the correct respondents? How will you balance the need for accuracy with the budget when it comes to sample size and type? The key is never assume that as long as you talk to enough people, you will have enough information to solve the problem at hand. Make sure you are talking to the right people. You've heard the saying, ask a stupid question, get a stupid answer, right? As we think about market research, it may be more precise to say, ask a question stupidly, get a useless answer. If you've ever filled out a survey and thought, none of these options apply to me, you know what I mean. So let's talk about what goes into creating a good set of questions for your research. There are two types of questions, open-ended and closed-ended questions. Closed-ended questions are questions with a limited choice of responses, whereas open-ended questions do not limit responses. To illustrate the difference, consider these two questions. Tell me about why you shop at Minimart versus which of the following are reasons why you shop at Minimart. The first question is open-ended, meaning the respondent answers with whatever comes to mind, and as they answer, the interviewer can ask follow-up questions about their response. For example, if the respondent answers, because it's convenient, the interviewer can ask, what does convenient mean? And why do you consider Minimart to be convenient? The second question, which of the following are reasons why you shop at Minimart is a closed-ended question, which means that the respondent can only select from a list of predetermined options, like convenient location, variety of products, price, etc. Designing well-formulated questions is an absolute requirement to getting useful data. So let's consider some not-so-well-formulated questions to get a sense of what we mean. Question number one. What is your age? With these options to choose from. How does someone respond if they're 30? Would they check box B or box C? The problem is that when you're analyzing the results, you don't know which box the 30-year-old respondents checked. Ensure that your answers are mutually exclusive. Question number two. You indicated that you eat at Pete's Shack less than once a month. Why don't you eat there more often? with these options. What if the respondent's reason is that there isn't a location near their house, or they don't like the food? They will be forced to pick an answer that does not represent their reason, which will skew your data. At the very least, this question should have an other option, but it is important to ensure that you have a fairly complete list of options to choose from. Question number three. What is the fastest and most economical way to get from New York to Boston? Well, an airplane is the fastest, but a bus is the most economical. How would a respondent answer? Do you pick the airplane or the bus? Or do you pick something in between? Unfortunately, when you analyze the data, you'll have no idea what the respondent was thinking when they answered. 
ensure that you are asking only one question at a time. Question number four. Don't you agree that the government should not force us to pay higher taxes? This is what we call a leading or biased question. You are biasing the answer by setting up the question in a way that makes it appear there is one right answer. Don't you agree implies that the right answer is to agree. Additionally, use of extreme words like force can also bias the answer. So you can see how important the design of the questions is. If you ask a poorly designed question, you'll have no idea whether the results are reliable or how to interpret them. Have you set yourself up for success? The best way to know is to test the questions before you launch your project. Have you ever noticed that well-written articles use an inverted pyramid structure for the flow of information? It starts with the broad information first, who, what, when, where, and why, to give the reader the basic information, set the context for what follows, and generally engage the reader. The article then moves to the important details of the story and finishes with background information. A similar approach is used for structuring the questions in a market research survey or discussion guide. In most cases, you are going to structure your questions from broad basic questions to more specific ones. This funnel approach serves several purposes. First, it allows the respondent to ease into their participation. The first questions are crucial as they set the tone for the rest of the survey or interview. If the first questions are threatening or uninteresting, the respondent may refuse to answer the rest of the questions. So start with easy to answer factual questions that are on topic. These initial questions may not even be relevant from an analysis perspective, but may simply relax the respondent and gain their cooperation for answering the more specific questions later. Second, it gives you context for the subsequent answers. If they share with you that their car was recently in the shop three times for repairs, and you later ask what factors are most important in a new car purchase, you have some context for why they might put reliability and warranties at the top of the list. Third, it lends itself to a degree of logic, which is a requirement for a good survey. Jumping from topic to topic confuses the respondent and can therefore result in potentially contradictory answers. Fourth, it minimizes the likelihood that early questions will bias the answers to later questions. If a respondent is asked first about how prices compare among products and whether they think the products are reasonably priced, and then later you ask them what aspects of the product are most important, chances are price will be overemphasized because you've already introduced it, which to some degree implies that it's important. Finally, it establishes rapport so that the respondent is more open to answering more sensitive or specific questions later. As an example, let's say you want to get a reaction to a new over-the-counter pain medication. You might start with general questions like, under what circumstances do you use an over-the-counter pain medication? How often do you use them? Which brand or brands do you use today and why? These are not too personal, so they are relatively easy to answer and serve to warm up the respondent for the topic at hand. Then you might move to what are the most important characteristics of pain medications? What do you like and dislike about the current products? What would an ideal pain medication look like? These are a bit more personal as they involve some level of judgment, but by now the respondent is engaged. Additionally, by asking what is top of mind, you've not biased their thoughts on the new product that will be shown next. Then finally, you move into a description of the new product and ask what their thoughts are, likes and dislikes, and how likely they would be to use it. You have a context for their responses as they previously shared what they thought an ideal medication would look like. So as you structure the survey or discussion guide, keep the inverted pyramid in mind. Introduce broad topics first, and then drill down to more specific topics. Begin with framing questions, before moving to more specific questions. If you give the respondent an opportunity to warm up, relax, and get engaged before honing in on the key questions, you have substantially increased the likelihood of getting information that will be useful in solving your research problem.
Think of the last time you purchased an item and someone contacted you to get feedback on your experience. Did you receive a survey in the mail or via email? Or did someone call you? Did you respond? Whoever was conducting the research had to weigh the pros and cons of each of these options for collecting data, considering budget, time, response rates, and availability of contact information to decide what method to use. The same will be true for you when you conduct your research. In addition to internet surveys, mail surveys, or phone surveys, you could consider intercept surveys, where you stop people on the street or exiting the polls or in the mall. Or you might consider recruiting people to come to a specific location, where they could take a self-administered survey or do a one-on-one -on -one interview or participate in a focus group. Or you could do some combination of these options. The choice will depend on several factors, such as the number of participants, where the respondents live, the type of information you need, your budget, and the demographics of your participants, among other things. Here are a few examples to help you understand how the project needs may influence the data collection method. Let's say you need to get 2,000 people ages 25 to 80 to participate, and you have a limited budget. That's a lot of people. So stopping people in the mall might not be efficient or representative, and recruiting people to a central location might cost too much. So here, you might consider internet or phone options. If the topic of your research is determining the type of people who shop at a specific mall, then doing a mall intercept might be the most appropriate option. If you have a complex topic or need to show people a product, you really have to consider an in-person option. If your respondent population is elderly, not all of them might be on the internet, so a telephone survey may work better. If your respondent population includes people who might have difficulty reading or writing, a self-administered survey might not be the right option. If you're discussing a politically or personally sensitive topic, a group setting might not be the right option. There really is no single right way to collect your data, but it is important to consider the trade-offs to determine which one or ones fit best with your objectives and project constraints. So ask yourself some questions to help you determine what will work for your project. What information am I looking for? Does this rule out any of the collection methods? What is the budget and how does that impact my choices? Where are the respondents I need to include and what's the best method for reaching them? Are there any special considerations for my respondent base? Once you have answered these types of questions, it is very likely that you will have a good idea of which method will best balance the pros and cons for your project. In theater, when the curtain goes up, the audience watches as a play unfolds, telling a story. The audience is unaware of all the work that transpired behind the curtain leading up to this one show. Their experience and their review will be based only on what they see when the curtain goes up. In market research, the report is much like what happens when the curtain goes up. Many people who read the report will have had no involvement with what went on backstage. The entire market research project will be evaluated on the basis of how well the report tells the story. In fact, research indicates that the report is one of the five most important elements affecting whether or not the results of the research actually get used. So let's look at the elements of a good market research report. First, know the audience. Who is going to be reading the report? What were their assumptions going into the project? What do they know about the project? The answers to these questions will frame the report. For example, if the results contradict what their beliefs were going into the project, the report may need to highlight the comparisons between the actual results and the expected results. Second, ensure that the report is a complete representation of the project. Provide enough background on the project for a reader to understand the circumstances that led to the initiation of the research. Remember, some of your readers will know nothing about this project. Briefly explain the methodologies of the research, including sample design and any rationale for those methodologies. Clearly state the objectives and key questions the research sought to address. Then ensure that the bulk of the report addresses these objectives and key questions. Third, be clear and concise. 
This doesn't mean the report should be short, but it does mean it shouldn't be a data dump of everything you learned. Address the objectives with enough information to back them up, and do so within a logical, organized structure. Keep sentences brief and to the point, and when possible, use visuals to communicate rather than a paragraph of text. Continuously ask yourself, what am I trying to say here, and why am I trying to say it? If you can't answer these questions, you can be sure your audience can't either. Fourth, tell a story. Summarize the results, but include verbatims to flavor the findings and bring them to life. Chip and Dan Heath, authors of multiple books, explain that data are just summaries of thousands of stories. Tell a few of those stories to help make the data meaningful. It's the story that will keep the audience engaged in the results. Finally, tell them what the results mean to their business. This is, after all, why the research was done, to make some decision about the business. These are the conclusions and recommendations and should clearly tie back to the objectives. And I cannot emphasize the importance of checking that the report is free of spelling and grammatical errors. Nothing diminishes the perception of the quality of the report and hence the quality of the entire research project faster than typos. Have someone else proofread before you hit send. So as you are writing the report, ask yourself, will this report engage the audience? Did I give them context for why and how the research was done? Did I loop back and address the objectives that were established? Did I provide the right amount of data in a way that is meaningful? One of the laws of market research is that people would rather live with a problem they cannot solve than accept a solution they cannot understand. Make sure your readers understand the solution so the results will actually be used. Unfortunately, there are several opportunities for errors to occur during the market research process that can lead to poor data collection and therefore unusable results. One category of errors is sampling errors, which primarily applies to quantitative research. Since it's impractical to survey every single person in your target audience, you have likely selected a sample of the population whose opinions will represent the total population. Sampling errors result in the sample not being representative. Let's look at the possible sampling errors and how to minimize them. Population specification error. This error occurs when the researcher doesn't understand who should be included in the survey. For example, if you're conducting research on future car purchases and you sample current car owners, you've missed a segment of your population, namely those who don't currently have a car but may consider a purchase in the future. Sample frame error. The sample frame is the population from which the sample is chosen, and this type of error occurs when that population isn't representative of your total. A classic example of this occurred in the 1936 presidential election. The researchers used car registrations and the telephone directory as sources for their sample, randomly selecting names from both for their poll. However, in 1936, many Americans didn't own cars or telephones, and those who did were largely Republican. So when their random sample was polled, they wrongly predicted a Republican victory. Selection error. This type of error occurs when respondents self-select their participation. Only those interested respond. For example, suppose you're looking to get feedback on airline services. If you survey only those who are interested in the survey topic, there's a possibility that you'll have a negatively skewed result. Those interested in participating may be more likely to have had a bad experience and now want an opportunity to vent. You can minimize this through persistent follow-up with everyone invited to participate. Non-response error. This type of error occurs when the makeup of the audience who responds to the survey is different than the makeup of your total audience population. Non-response errors have increased in recent years with the institution of laws inhibiting telemarketing and caller ID, enabling people to not answer calls from parties they don't recognize. Convenient samples may also result in a population that's not representative of the total audience, but this is less of an error than a choice. 
If, for example, you've chosen a specific location for conducting the research out of convenience or cost, this sample may not be representative of the total sample. The difference is that in this case, you're consciously making the decision to bias the sample and can take this into account when analyzing the data. So as you move forward with your research, think about these opportunities for error as you consider both the design of the sample and the data collection methods. Meet with a statistician at the start of the project to determine the sample size needed to minimize these errors. Consider what resources you'll use to get people to participate. Sampling errors can be minimized by careful sample designs, large samples, and persistent multiple contacts and follow-ups to ensure a representative response. In market research, we use the phrase garbage in, garbage out, meaning that when the data collection is flawed, the results won't be useful. Response errors are errors that occur during the data collection and are not related to the sample itself. While sampling errors are most applicable to quantitative research, response errors can be found in both qualitative and quantitative research. There are four primary types of response errors. The first type of error is respondent error. This refers to the respondent providing incorrect information, either intentionally or unintentionally, for any number of different reasons. The respondent may not want to give the true answer because the question is sensitive or there are socially acceptable responses. This is more likely to occur when the respondent is answering questions verbally versus in a written or online format where there's greater anonymity. For example, if you asked a question like, do you take medication to manage stress? The respondent may not want to admit that, in fact, he does take medication to manage stress. Questions that rely on memory or recall can often result in unintended respondent error. For example, asking a respondent how much they spent at the grocery store last week. The respondent may be trying to answer truthfully, but may not know the actual amount spent. Respondent error can also occur with fatigue or lack of engagement during the research, which may result in giving average answers versus thoughtful, accurate responses, or the respondent may simply misunderstand the question. The second type of error is interviewer bias. This can either be biased responses from the respondent based on who the interviewer is, or the interviewer imposing bias in the way questions are asked. In the first situation, the respondent may engage with the interviewer differently based on the interview's gender or ethnicity. A female respondent may provide very different responses to the same questions if asked by a female interviewer versus a male interviewer. In the second situation, the interviewer can also bias the results. Different interviewers may administer a survey in different ways. In qualitative research where the questions are less structured, the interviewer may ask questions in a biased way, such as, don't you think that X is better than Y? Or the order in which questions are asked may bias answers to subsequent questions. Interviewer bias can be minimized by matching gender and ethnicity as often as possible and hiring skilled interviewers to conduct the research. The third error is measurement error, which is generally a result of poorly worded questions. The question may use language that is unclear to the respondent or may be ambiguously worded. The list of potential answers might be incomplete or definitions may be open to interpretation. For example, asking an employer how many part-time employees they have will result in different answers depending on how the employer defines a part-time worker. Measurement error can be minimized by pre-testing the questionnaire to ensure that all questions are well-formulated and easily interpreted. The final type of response error is recording error. This is often simply a matter of incorrectly typing a response. This can be minimized by instituting controls in data processing and or using a computer program that can check logic consistency across answers and flag those that don't make sense. Response errors cannot be completely avoided. What steps can you take to ensure that the data coming in will not be producing garbage going out? Ever start a simple project only to have it balloon out of control? You know what I'm talking about. 
The bedroom needs a new coat of paint. Simple enough, just buy the paint, find the time to do it. But then you think, oh, maybe a new color would be nice. But then the curtains don't really go with it, so you need a new window treatment. And as long as you're doing all of that, you might as well get a new light fixture. Sound familiar? When conducting market research, it is all too common to hear the phrase, as long as we're doing this, why don't we ask fill in the blank? We call this scope creep, which refers to changes in the original parameters of the project, which you established when you formulated the research problem. Talking to customers is so beneficial that when others learn that you will be doing this, they want to jump on the bandwagon. Unfortunately, adding objectives and other desired information to the original plan can significantly impact the timeline and the budget. Additionally, as you add length to the interview or survey, you risk respondent fatigue, which can decrease the quality of the data collected. So what can you do to prevent this? First, you should involve all stakeholders who will be using the research results early on in the project. Don't assume you know what others will want from the research. Allow them to provide direct input. Once you have all the input, it's critical to prioritize the need to know from the nice to know information. Ensure that all information being sought will be actionable. Once you've done this, you put the information into a clearly defined research objective. What needs to be done, action, and with whom, target market, what information is needed, how the information is going to be used. Establish the deliverables for the project and get others to sign off on it. Finally, implement a process for making changes to the original project scope. Even though you've put everything in place to avoid scope creep, there may still be times when there is a need to expand the project parameters. Just ensure that it is a conscious decision and all parties understand the implications to the budget and timeline. So imagine starting your room renovation with a list of everything you might like to do, getting input from anyone else who might have an opinion, and prioritizing the must-do versus the nice-to-do. Then you can make fewer trips to the store and end the project on time and on budget. Don't just wish your market research project could run that smoothly. Plan for it and make it happen. Former Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart once said, ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do. The ability to conduct market research depends on the willingness of the public to participate. Currently, people are getting more and more protective of their privacy, which makes it more difficult to recruit respondents. Bad research experiences that violate the trust of participants can only make it worse. This is all the more reason why researchers must abide by a code of ethics that protects participants. So let's talk about a few of the key ethical considerations concerning respondents. First is that it is critical to preserve the anonymity of and the privacy of respondents. This means that personal information about the respondents, including full name, phone number, email addresses, or any other identifying piece of information should not be revealed to the client. In addition to the researcher, anyone observing the research or utilizing the data must adhere to this as well. Second is that any potential respondent must be informed up front what the purpose of the research is and what their participation entails, and they must willingly give their consent to participate. Third is that if the research will be audio or video recorded or is being observed, the respondent must be informed of this up front and must be given the option to refuse. At any time during the research, the respondent always has the option not to answer a question or not to continue with the research. Fourth is that the information be used for market research purposes only. This is not about selling or promoting anything, and the information should not be used for sales or solicitations. This one might not be quite as clear, so let's consider two examples. You are conducting focus groups with surgeons, and during the course of the group, one of them expresses a negative opinion about your company's product due to some incorrect information. The regional managers observing the focus group recognizes the surgeon and immediately contacts the local rep to tell him to meet with the surgeon to give him the right information. That would violate two of our rules, not preserving anonymity and privacy of the respondent and using the information to sell specifically to that individual. 
Another example, a client or a colleague approaches you to conduct research on a new product that's about to be launched. They want you to contact a specific list of competitive users to share the details of the product, get feedback, and gauge interest. Here, you need to be very careful about the intent of the research. The fact that a specific list of competitive users is being used to recruit makes this sound a bit like paying someone to listen to a sales pitch. The researcher also has an obligation to abide by the code of ethics that apply to the client or whomever initiated the research. Among the most important of these is to provide appropriate disclosure of the means and methods used to conduct the research and to always report research results accurately and honestly, even if they are not what the client wants to hear. For a complete code of ethics, you can visit the Marketing Research Association's website, marketingresearch.org. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Put yourself in the respondent's shoes and ask yourself, how would you like to be treated? This is often the best gauge of whether or not something is within the code of ethics. When you think about what makes a company successful, customers are going to be at the top of that list. But what really differentiates one company from another is how well they know their customer. And market research is the key. Market research is all about getting to know your customer at a deeper level. What they want, what they need, and what makes them tick. As a result of this course, you should now understand the fundamentals of market research and understand the tools available to conduct a successful market research project. If this course is what your appetite and you want to learn more, there are a number of organizations that you might find helpful, including the Marketing Research Association, the Qualitative Research Consultants Association, the Council of American Survey Research Organizations, and the European Society for Opinion and Market Research. One of the things I hope you've taken away from this course is that although market research is a science, it is very much an art as well. So take what you've learned and get to know your customer. You'll be surprised at what you might discover. <laughs>